Welcome to making stuff. Oops, scratch that. Welcome to making PCBs or printed circuit boards with Chris Dayhut. This is episode number one in a series of videos about making PCBs. Rather than gloss over a few points, this will take a more detailed, in depth look at the process. While there are means to get circuit boards made professionally rather quickly, uh, you can uh, go through, uh, design up your circuit board, send the files to a company, typically offshore, overseas, China, and uh, they can very quickly make the circuit board for you at a reasonable price and ship it to you in about a week. However, that may not be fast enough. As hobbyists or as professionals, sometimes you need a circuit board now so that you can continue on with your project. And that's who this is really for. Those of us that want to do it and want it right now. For us makers or tinkers or hobbyists, getting a circuit board made uh, can be challenging. Uh, we can design it up, hopefully, and uh, send it to an overseas factory and they can manufacture it rather quickly and ship it to us. Turnaround time is about a week. There is a fair amount of cost in shipping and all that and the manufacturing cost has been greatly reduced because of their business model, tailoring their services to small batch runs and they do a very good job of it. But often we want our circuit boards now, today. I came up with an idea this morning. I've got the schematic. I want to put it onto copper and see how it all performs so I can continue with the rest of my project. There's uh, a number of different ways we can make them in our home shops. There's, for the most part, four common methods. And this series is going to focus initially on isolation milling, which requires a CNC router to do it with. And we'll get into a lot of details on that, and the costs aren't as high as you may think. Circuit boards can be made using perforated boards that are made specifically for that purpose. There are holes drilled in the PCB with pads around each hole. Simply insert the component, and solder it in place, then connect them with wires. After you get that done, you would also need to cut the PCB to size and shape as needed. The next method that's very common is chemical etching or sometimes called chemical machining. It's a process where you use chemicals to remove the copper in areas where you don't want it. For example, around a trace or a pad. A trace is what is called, so to speak, a wire that conducts electricity from one location to another. After you do that uh, etching process, you would then manually drill the holes and then cut the shape of the circuit board to the, to the desired shape. Our focus for this series is isolation milling, which describes a process wherein a CNC machine uses a tool to cut channels in the copper clad board to isolate areas of copper from one another. Because the machine is a CNC milling type machine tool, it is very flexible in what it can do besides isolation milling. We can do milling, drilling, cutting, and engraving. Evolution has taken this isolation milling process into the next level, and that is laser engraving. We would use laser engraving uh, in a similar process to isolation milling, but instead of a cutting tool, a laser is used to remove the copper. After lasing, you would need to drill the holes, and depending on the power of your laser, you would also have to cut the PCB to the desired shape. Continuing with our comparison and discussion between the different methods, I think it's important that you understand why I favor 
isolation milling. I can have a PCB within hours, including design time. Often I'm very impatient and want to do things now, not next week. I have the equipment. Yes, I'm very fortunate in that I have a very good CNC router that has been actually optimized for making PCBs. But it's a CNC router, so it's a very universal tool in my shop. And you'd be surprised as to how inexpensive they are these days. Isolation milling, hole drilling, legend engraving, and shape cutting in one process, meaning that I can put it on this one machine and perform all those operations. I can get very good looking results. They're not professional, but they're very close. I can get very good functional results with my process, meaning that it uh, provides me with a circuit board that is functional and reliable, and the process is refined, and I don't have to fiddle around with a lot of different trial and error each time I try to make a circuit board. There's no toxic chemicals to dispose of, and there are no toxic fumes causing severe damage to other tools and machinery in my shop. Ferric chloride and cupric chloride, the two most common chemical mixtures, can are very corrosive and can cause a lot of damage. Looking at a few of the drawbacks, or isolation milling, professional circuit boards look and function much better. No doubt about that. The equipment uh, can be expensive depending on your perspective. Uh, if you're just buying a CNC router for making PCBs, yes, it, it's a pretty healthy investment. No matter what, you're still going to need the drill bits to drill the holes, so that cost is a wash. Limited resolution. Your trace width would be approximately 10 thousandths of an inch or 0.25 millimeters and larger. In rare instances, you can actually have a narrower trace width, but it does take extra caution and extra steps. You're limited to the number of traces between pins and pads, and that's really important when you're working with integrated circuits, especially the surface mount ones, where you need to run traces between two pads. You can only make traces so small in this process, and it may not work with some of your components, so be aware of that. But the rule as mentioned uh, just previously, stands pretty true. You're pretty well limited to two layers, just as you would be with perf board, chemical etching, or laser engraving. Uh, these all pretty much fit into that two layer category where you can't go beyond that, and professional circuit boards can. To help with understanding and having a good comparison between the four different methods that we're talking about, I've created this comparison chart. I'll keep it brief, but it is important to understand each of these features and whether it's an advantage or disadvantage. Cost, perf board is the cheapest. Laser engraving, because the machines are still expensive, is the most expensive. Uh, chemical machining isn't so bad. Uh, depends on the chemicals you're using and the required support equipment for them. Isolation milling, you can get them cheap, but you're going to do a lot more of the uh, nitpicky stuff than you would with a, go a good or better machine. Accuracy. Perf boards, well, pretty much they're very low resolution. You got a hole that's every 0.1 inches apart and that's about as fine of a resolution as you can get. There are four very simple circuit boards. Isolation milling, chemical machining, and laser graving, engraving are all very high accuracy systems. Drilling for perf, perf board is not needed. If you're doing isolation milling on a CNC machine, it can perform the drilling operations for you using drills. 
chemical machining and laser engraving do not offer that capability. Resolution, meaning how fine of a trace can you create? Well, on a perf board, it's low. You got essentially a wire that's going to connect the two. Isolation milling, I'm saying that 0.25 millimeters or greater than 10 thousandths of an inch is a medium resolution. Chemical machining can get very, very precise and very, very fine resolution, as can laser engraving. The, for laser engraving, it is highly dependent upon the quality of your laser. Outline milling re refers to the process of extracting the circuit board from the bulk material. In other words, cutting around the shape that you actually want the circuit board to be in at the end. With perf boards, you're just going to have to cut it in any which way shape that you can come up with. Uh, shears, scissors, scoring, breaking, uh, sawing isn't really practical unless you get a carbide tooth band saw or something like that. Isolation milling, we can use a milling cutter specifically designed for that purpose that will last a very long time and perform the job very accurately. For chemical machining and laser engraving, you're going to have to come up with a way to do that using another tool. Double-sided capability for circuit boards. Perf boards, eh, you can kind of do double-sided, but it's going to be very clunky at best. Uh, getting components on the top and the bottom in perf boards more often than not is more trouble than work. But with isolation milling, chemical machining, and laser engraving, you can do double-sided boards very accurately as long as you develop a process to do it accurately. Uh, reliable processes. This is something that for me is very valuable, especially having made circuit boards for so long and using three of these four methods. Now, working with perf board, let's face it, it's dead simple. Takes a little bit of tinkering, but it's basic soldering, wires, and uh, pads and holes. So you're going to solder things up. So it's pretty darn reliable. When using the isolation milling method, it's a very reliable process, at least the process that I'm going to show you, which has been refined over time. Chemical machining and, uh, well, let's keep these separate. Chemical machining, I have found very variable. I can get a process working good, and then a few weeks later, repeat that process, and everything goes wrong. It has to do with many different steps of the process to get the results you need. And those steps are not really easy to uh, analyze and understand when it's right and when it's wrong because a lot of it is invisible until you get the final result. Laser engraving, I have no personal experience with as far as making PCBs, so I don't want to comp. Uh, comment on whether it's reliable or not. For through holes, the perf board really stands alone in that regard because the holes are already in the material, but they are in very specific locations of which you have no control over. With isolation milling, through the process in its entirety, you can also perform the drilling operations using different size drills and putting the holes exactly where you want them. For chemical machining and laser engraving, that would be entirely a manual process to drill the holes. Surface mount chips and so forth really don't work well with perf board. You can kind of get them to work sometimes, but it's rare. Isolation milling can easily create surface mount pads in any location and with great accuracy, just as you can with chemical machining and laser engraving. Toxic and hazardous chemicals. For perf boards, not really. Uh, not at least in the manufacturing aspect of it or the usage aspect of it as we would as a hobbyist. For isolation milling, 
Uh, you could perceive the copper waste or the circuit board material waste as possibly toxic, but the volume and quantities are extremely small. For other comp industrial companies that are processing G10 material and other resin glass materials, their products are not really considered hazardous waste either, even at their volumes. Chemical machining, yes, you're going to have toxic and or hazardous chemicals. There are some non-toxic chemicals. There are some chemicals that are very toxic. Uh, are they hazardous? It depends on your location and then what they allow and what they consider to be toxic or hazardous. I myself know that when I've had the chemicals in my shop for extended periods of time, even closed up inside of a Tupperware type container, sealed tight, it was hazardous to all the tooling in my shop within a 10 to 20 foot about a three to four meter radius of that solution. So to me, it's nasty stuff. And finally, laser engraving generally is not considered hazardous, although the fumes from the process of lasing the copper and substrate material could be hazardous. That I am not sure of. Well, hopefully that gives you a real good idea of the variety of methods used to create circuit boards at home. In our next video, we're going to take a very detailed look at what is needed for the isolation milling process. That'll wrap it up for this video. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. And if you could be so kind as to subscribe or give me a like or share with your friends, I would greatly appreciate it.